I was fascinated to hear Kieran's um, presentation, particularly those slides on the uh, disruptive technology. Our company, Tech Capital, exists because of disruptive technology. That is what we're here for. We take university intellectual property and we seek to commercialize it. It's still true, alarmingly true, that a great part of the world's new great ideas never get commercialized. The companies, one of a number of companies, who are dedicated to that commercialization. Um, there are some that have been around for quite a while, but we're relatively young in the game. I'm going to come back to this nice lady and her spectacles later. But, um, first off, let me show you the companies that we've picked out that are in our space and are established. And you may have come across those companies. IP Group, Allied Mines, uh, and uh, the other companies there. They're all established companies commercializing university IP. Tech Capital is late to the game. We listed four years ago, and we deliberately uh, set a slightly different path trying to learn, I suppose, from their experience, and also test some different ideas. So, for example, if you're one of those companies, you'll be sitting on top of a fountain of great ideas from so some great universities, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and so on. And those relationships will generate for them a wonderful field from which to pick. Uh, but we say, well, what about the rest of the world? There's an awful lot of ideas that they're not seeing. And so we built a search engine uh, which can see all of the technologies, all of the new patented technologies that universities right around the world have available for commercialization. We see all of it. And that means that when we are looking to pick technologies to invest in, we're seeing from the whole field, not just from, albeit very good universities, we're seeing all of it, including the stuff that they're seeing. The second difference for us is we thought that uh, the cycle that these guys have invested in, in incubation, is too long. Typically, they'll take five, six years to incubate something from an idea, from a patented technology, through to being a product that they can then commercialize or sell uh, to a big company. And that, it works. There's nothing wrong with their model. They're making money. But for us, we thought, can we speed this up? Because of this point about uh, disruptive technology, things are happening much faster than they used to. And so we set ourselves a selection criterion to try and pick technologies that could be commercialized within two years. It's quite an ambitious thing to do, but we've used that as a test. The third difference is that when we pick up these technologies, we don't just have two or three of us in the team selecting the ones we're going to go with, which is kind of what those companies have. They have great experts doing it, but there's their own small team. What we've done is engage, uh, at the moment, 60 of the world's leading uh, scientists. I've got a list. It's in the presentation. Um, some of these people are really world-class, world-leading scientists. And they're not on our payroll, but they're so fascinated by exposure to what our search engine can dig up for them that virtually free, they want to read through that and help us to select the five or ten technologies that our own people should then be picking from. So we're looking at a much bigger universe, the whole universe, and we've got experts who are independently helping us to pick the winners. And that means statistically over time we should end up picking better winners. Uh, the fourth difference is that uh, we are very mean with our money, with our shareholders' money. We don't want to be investing 5 million, 50 million in uh, an incubation project. Now, if you look at an IP group, it's there with a market cap of 1.3 or whatever billion pounds. But half of that money was invested by shareholders. Okay? So they've doubled the money over the 20 years they've been in business, and that's a great performance. But we are much more ambitious than that for our shareholders. So we are very mean with the money. And when we set the company up and listed it in 2014, the first thing we did was to dedicate the first two years to building a services platform. So we are building, uh, we have revenues that almost cover our operating costs from the services that we do. We did that also for another reason. It's to uh, enhance our exposure to the industry we work in. So we are now familiar with a lot of the world's big companies. We do work for them, and also for a lot of the world's big universities. And that helps us with our market presence. But the real reason for it is that the services revenue means we are not coming back to our shareholders frequently looking for money to keep the lights on. Okay, so that was part of our decision. And then when we reached that certain point uh, in about 2017, 2016, we decided we were now ready to start doing incubation. Until that point, we didn't really apply ourselves to that. We knew the model we wanted would be slightly different from what these guys are doing, good those there, theirs is, and we found our own path, and I'll explain that to you, how we move forward. But I wanted to just introduce you in that context of the market we're operating in. The search engine is a pretty impressive beast. 
as I say, it can see all of the intellectual property that every university in the world makes available for commercialization. It's a pretty powerful tool. And in fact, we have an app which you can, uh, you can get which allows you to do that. Uh, these are some of the people we have on our, uh, uh, our advisory board. There's some pretty amazing people in there. I won't bore you with the detail. The uh, companies we work with, these are some of the universities we work with and some of the companies we work with. And for a little company, and we are a small company still, uh, it's not bad that we do work with Ford and PepsiCo and General Motors and uh, IBM. You know, that's not bad an achievement for us as a small company. And we're providing services to them, and our services are still growing at 25% a year plus. We continue to move to the point where we won't need shareholder funding to keep the lights on. I'm going to uh, take you through three uh, companies that we've launched. Uh, there's Belloscura, I'll come back to it in a minute, and then there's Lucid and Solarius. There's a few more I'm going to just quickly show you. You can see them in the presentation. These are all coming up behind um, and will be uh, launched soon. But I want to talk about those three. These are our first three incubation attempts, and they all fit the model that I've described to you. First up is Belloscura. Belloscura, we... Uh, found uh, a niche market opportunity about a year, 18 months ago. Big companies in the United States have spent millions and millions developing medical products. It's a huge industry in the US. And uh, those big companies have got some fabulous material. But what they've done is they've developed products that are no longer top of their list for pushing. They've spent a lot of money. They've had their money back by selling it over the years. And they're now focusing on other things. And so they have been uh, selling off cheap, uh, a lot of these products, and we are consolidating that. We're picking from amongst the ones they're getting rid of, the products that we think we can put together, reinvigorate, and even if we don't reinvigorate, we'll pick up the tail of those products, which because they've got many years of life left in them. So it's a consolidation play. Um, we now own 40% of it. We did the standard thing, really, of putting a million or two dollars into it ourselves, and then going out and finding funding from other people. Um, and that's why we've been shrunk down to 40%. But uh, they're planning to do an IPO later this year. They're off and running on their own. They're a separate business, and that's our first spin-out. Okay, uh, Successful already, and with much more success to come. Lucid and Solarius are actually more true examples of our incubation model, uh, in as much as we found <coughs> the original patents for these two, and we have taken it from concept through to uh, we will have success in the marketplace within the next 12 months. And so these are examples of what can be done within two years, both of them taken from start to finish within two years. Lucid is augmented reality smart glasses. You probably all remember um, Google Glasses that came out about five years ago. And if you remember them, they were kind of one size fits all. It was a standard product, a very good product, uh, innovative, the first mover and so on, and they did well. But uh, they had to withdraw them because actually in the market they weren't really good enough yet. Uh, we came across some patents in the United States uh, just over a year ago, which are the second generation of smart glasses. Okay? And how they're different is the, uh, what you see on your screen has been significantly enhanced, what you can see in front of you. Uh, the, uh, the carrying of it in your glasses is much simpler now than it was before. You don't need such a big clunky set of goggles. And perhaps most beautiful of all, it will work on your spectacles, your glasses, your prescription lenses, your choice of frames. This is a technology that within 12 months will be available. It'll be prototyped. We're working on that now. And uh, an interesting twist on that was we didn't want to dilute on that. We didn't want to end up with 40%. So rather than bring in other investors, we put in our million dollars, as we do, being mean. And then we went to uh, the uh, cryptocurrency market, um, which is natural for this, actually, because this is really geeky technology. And a lot of people wanted to participate. And we sold tokens. Uh, and the token sale finished in February. And we raised $6 million, which is more than we need for the uh, prototype to be developed. Um, so we still own 100% of Lucid. And our plan for that is to sell it one day to someone like Google. And then the Solarius, which is my favorite of the bunch, actually. It's my favorite of all. Um, Salt has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, and we all digest about twice as much salt as is good for us, OK? We like the taste of salt, but it's killing us. And it's going to kill our kids and our grandchildren if we don't stop it. And about 20 years ago, people started to come up with real alternatives to that. Um, 
salt that doesn't contain sodium, for example. You can get potassium uh, salt. And uh, that's fine, but it tastes a bit strange. But it is healthier for you. But what we've got is a product that is salt. It's exactly the same chemically as ordinary salt. But, and it gives you exactly the same flavor as you normally get from salt. But you'd actually ingest half as much salt. So it's a fantastic product. I love this. Um, and they basically, the secret of it is the particle size. Natural salt occurs in a particle size. Well, you know what size salt is. Um, and uh, you put that on your tongue, and your tongue picks up about 50% of that salt and turns it into flavor. The other 50% just goes straight down your throat without having given you any benefit whatsoever. And it's that 50% you want to stop ingesting because it's killing you. And what we have is a patented technology for making natural salt, but in much smaller particles. And that means that when you put that on your peanuts or your crisps uh, or on your fish and chips, you just put on less of it, but you still get the same amount of flavor. You're not going to be an unhappy customer, and you're going to live longer. So it's a pretty neat product. We've shown it to a number of the food companies in the United States. They're fascinated by it. We're putting together a board for this company, and some of these people that want to be on the board are pretty impressive names. And the plan for it is to take the product now and do a bit of market testing with it, prove to people what it is. We've already got the product. We've already made several bags of the stuff. It's actually not that difficult to make. And uh, we believe that this will be taken up by pretty much everybody eventually, but certainly all of the major fast food manufacturers. They're going to be a bit sick in a few years' time if they haven't adopted this technology. Um, and that's cost us about a million bucks so far. So what I loved about what Kieran was saying is out there, there's an awful lot of technology being invented by smart people at universities, really potentially disruptive, really enhancing to the lives of people. And a lot of it is just not getting commercialized fast enough. And our intention is to develop this model where it's relatively low cost of entry, where we're taking the technology just to the point where large companies will take it up. What we've also found, and what um, <laughs> the other companies in this business have found, is that companies, big companies, really are kind of clunky at picking up new technology. They're not geared for it. If you go to them, and we have actually tried this with some companies, you go to them with a wonderful new patented technology, and they say, that is fantastic, we love it. But they're actually really incompetent and not geared up to <coughs> taking it forward themselves. That's not their business, and they struggle with it. They kind of find it hard to digest the technology and make it run. And so what we're trying to do, and what these other companies also have been trying to do, is take the technology to the point where these big companies can adopt it and move it into the marketplace properly. Um, and the way IP Group have done it is a little bit slower than we think it can be done. Uh, they take, say, five years, and we want to try and do it always in two. And I think that's partly because the market is changing, but it is also because I think that may be the sweet spot for big companies being able to take it on. If we can show them a prototype of these lucid spectacles, if we can show them the salt in a, in a pack and they can see it, that's very, very different from showing them a patent. And I think they will be able to take these technologies forward if we bring them to that point. So that's our purpose. We're a small company, a market cap's still only 7 million. Um, but uh, we finally found, I think, the formula that will work and make us as successful as these guys, and hopefully more so. I just want to leave you with the last couple of slides. There's one slide at the end, which is probably still worth going through with you. What are we going to do over the next 12 months? We're going to continue to grow our services business, because that gives us access to the market, and it keeps the lights on. We're going to complete, uh, we're hopefully going to go ahead with the IPO of Bellascura, and that will continue to add value to us. We're now an investment company, so every time Bellascura does well or Lucid does well, that comes through in our accounts. Uh, we've got new products coming through into Bellascura, and that will, I hope, make Bellascura very successful in the near term. And we've done the funding for Lucid so that we know now uh, how we're going to get to the prototypes being available in 12 months. And we're about to get moving with the Solarius thing. We're already beginning to move on that. Um, so that's what we've got. We've got those three things moving forward. We just need to hit one of those out of the park. And our market cap's going to be a tiny fraction of, of what our end value is going to be. There's 7 million pounds. If one of those goes out of the park, it could be 70 million pounds. Quite easy, couldn't it? Uh, so that's the game we're in. And uh, if you look at our accounts, I've, I've got a new set of accounts for 2017 coming out soon. So I've got to be careful about those. But... If you look at the first half of 2017 against 2016, you can see that we're going in the right direction. We've got revenue growth, we've turned from loss to profit, and our net assets are growing. We're still small, but the model works, and if we can knock one of these three out of the park, 
will be transformed. And I then hope we'll go on and do more and more and more of these because it's beneficial to our shareholders, but it's also quite beneficial to the rest of us, to the planet as a whole. So that's Tech Capital. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll ask about uh, the, the, the blockchain crowdfunding. Yeah. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm sure lots of us kind of look at and scratch our heads a little bit. Mm. And can you talk through, A, the process, how it worked for the business, and then B, the people who invested in that, what do they then own? Yeah, very good questions. I have to say that when this was first put to me as the finance director, I did a lot of head scratching too and came up with those very same questions, uh, being a bit slightly conservative disposition. Um, the blockchain uh, appeals to this particular kind of technology, and we're going to do this again and again, I think, because it is dedicated to innovation and so are we. Uh, but what the, um, what the investors get is a token that means that when we do go into production with goggles eventually, they will be able to get a discounted pair and they'll be one of the first people to get them. And in a way, that's what they really want. They want to be one of the first people to have this new technology and they actually want to be partly responsible for developing it. It's a, it's a nice thing to do. So that is what they get out of it. And uh, what we get out of it is the money up front to do all that work. Uh, so it's very kind of them to be a part of our success and we, we like them for it. So just to clarify, they don't own the business, they don't Not own the, the technology, they are buying a product yeah. when the product becomes available. Absolutely. You get, the, you get the money up front. Correct, exactly that. We think it's a great model, we're going to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and you've reached the stage of being cash generative. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, we're cash generative from the services business. Um, we're applying some of that cash into the incubation stuff. So I think net net we're not cash generative. Okay. Um, we could be if we were to turn off the tap on the incubation, but why would you want to do that? I mean, that's what we're here for. And on the Bellascura, um, would that flow to, do you think, in London or is that for the US yeah. market? Or? No, it's for the UK market. I, I know uh, it's odd in a way because all of the products are for the US market. But the UK market, we found, uh, well, first of all, we're listed here, even though we're largely a US-based business. We believe the, US, the UK market has a better understanding of some of, the, uh, some of the opportunities that are available in the kind of activities that we're involved in. Innovative technology is well understood in America, of course it is, but we find that in the London market, we have the contacts that make us feel comfortable. Okay. Any questions for anyone else? Question here, please. Chris? How can you help platform protect from grinding, mini grains of thought? I know, it's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I, must, I was very surprised about that myself. Um, it is bizarre what you can get a patented te technology for. It's, it's, not, it's not really that uh, bizarre when you think about it, because for thousands of years it's been solved. We've all know there's been solved. And to, it is quite clever to uh, work out a technology for making those salt particles smaller. It's not totally simple. It involves something a bit, a bit like a giant spin dryer. I mean, I, I don't want to give too much away. But it's quite clever stuff, and uh, the guy who invented it deserves to get um, you know, the proceeds of doing that. Um, any other questions, please? Gentleman back here, please, Chris. So if you're a search engine for IP um, ideas, what are the most common search themes at the moment? Where are your, what, Actually, what are um, you quite interesting. A lot, of, a lot of time and effort is going into battery technology. Uh, a lot of time and effort is going to that, and also um, alternative energy in general. Uh, we, there's a lot of effort. In fact, we're looking at that ourselves. Um, uh, it's a very hot area. Then also biotech, uh, microbiology, things of that kind, um, and uh, food products. Yeah, because there's a big issue in society about healthiness of food, and there's a lot can be done in that. We've got another product called Crackle Baked, which I won't bore you with, but it's out there. It's basically a, a coating that you can put on chicken nuggets or basically instead of batter, and uh, you have half the fat. And it tastes exactly the same. We've been through all the tasting panels and, and sort of stuff. So, I mean, it, it may not seem like enormously scientifically wonderful, but it may change the lives of millions of people. The, the search engine, do you, do you own the search engine? We built it, yeah. You built it. Is there a way of commercialising that or, or getting or a premium or <laughs> letting people pay for access? Think, yeah. is, is that something you would explore? Uh, yeah, we have, uh, we have done that. We, for example, Ford is a, a customer of ours, and uh, they wanted to get a technology for stopping rats and mice from eating the cables underneath your cars, <laughs> okay. uh, particularly in America. Uh, and so they wanted to find a coating that would be rat-proof. And uh, they didn't know where to look, of course. How do you find it? And we found it. I can't remember where it was, but it was somewhere obscure. Um, and we brought it back and developed it and offered it to them, and they paid for that service. Okay. And, 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 and 
would, would, how would other company, another Ford know that you exist to... Well, this has the, been an issue for us. I mean, if there is one big issue for tech capital is that no one knows we exist. And so we're going to have to particularly put a big effort into that now. Um, uh, if we hit one out of the park, I think that will speak for itself and everybody will know we exist. But um, we do need to make more effort ourselves in doing that, now that we've got the formula right. Question at the front, please, Chris. Can you tell me, at this stage, do you have any institutional investors? Uh, we have, uh, we do, but um, the largest investor we have is Nigel Ray, who is um, a well-known investor. He owns about 20% of the company. Um, and we have some other investors who are quite recognisable. Can you give some example, more examples? Um, we've got some... Uh, no, I probably shouldn't really go into any more detail than that, but um, we do have a number of investors who are recognisable investors who invest in innovation. Question here, please. Um, if you've just raised four million pounds for Lucid and your market cap is eight, why do you think the uh, stock market is discounting you so much? Yeah, it's, it's the big question for us at the moment. And Well, I think we know the answer. I think there are three things going on there. First, we're slightly badly affected by the fact that all of these companies in that list are slightly down at the moment. And that's just the sector thing. But that's really a marginal part of it. I don't want to major on that. There are two things company-specific that are causing us trouble in that area. One is that we haven't yet hit one out of the park. I know we've been around for only four years, but people had expectations, and they still do. And some people are just not yet happy that we've proved it. Uh, I think when we do prove it, then it will make a big difference. Um, and there's not a lot we can do about that between now and then. But there's a, a third problem, and that is we have been an American-based business doing good stuff in America it hasn't really been properly communicated back to the market here in London. We have one or two uh, of our very fine investors who came in at IPO and kind of have to sell or have to look at selling some of their shares. And um, when the share price was 50 pence, and our market cap was quite a lot more than it is now, they started to do that and had doubled their money, so they were reasonably happy. But it, um, that very quickly tipped the share price down because we didn't have enough new buyers of shares. So uh, I guess that's part of the reason I'm here tonight, is to introduce the tech, tech capital story to new people who might want to participate in the company's successful future. Any other questions, please? Um, are there any projects coming in the UK or continental Europe? Uh, in practice, not that I'm aware of, but we do look at them in the UK and in continental <laughs> Europe. To be fair, most of the experts we have are in America. Most of the knowledge we have is in America. That's our home turf as a business. And there is an enormous amount to go at in America. Also, they're probably further ahead in being able to expedite this whole process. Um, although I think the UK is coming up close behind. Continental Europe might be a little bit more complicated. And I don't think any of those companies that we see as our peer group are, pretty, are big in continental Europe. In, um, on, on that first slide where you had your peer group, um, are there the equivalent companies in America? Are there equivalents to those companies that are American companies? Um, not so many, in fact. Um, it's interesting that this little group of our peer group is pretty much, well, they're all listed in London. And I think that's most historical accident. IP Group and Imperial Innovations were the first out of the hatch with this back in 2000 or thereabouts. And they established a familiarity in the London market with this whole business of university IP and how to commercialise it. And so other companies, even Allied Mines, which is largely an American venture, have come over here and been participants in the same marketplace. So although they exist in the United States, they are not really uh, any bigger or better than the ones that are listed over here. Okay. And no one is doing the tech capital model. No one else has got a search engine that can do what we do. No one else has got 60 uh, top scientists doing the selection process. And no one else is incubating with a, a company investment of only a million dollars and trying to get the money back in a couple of years. There's no one else with that model. And on the American um, university system, we, we, in the UK, rank universities traditionally by their research. And this might sound a really ignorant question, but what's the quality of research like in American institutions? Is it, um, I mean, the teaching might be very good. Mm. The students come out very capable and get good jobs. But what's the research quality like? That, is it comparable to the UK? It is, actually. And in fact, uh, quite a lot of the UK's universities are not that good. I mean, they're very good at teaching some of them. But there's not that big a pool that are very, very good at research. Um, I mean, we've got enough. I'm not going to complain. We've got plenty. But in the United States, it's a similar pattern. Um, what I would say is the Americans also have government-funded uh, 
research institutions. The military have an awful lot of research activity, and we get to see what they produce too, obviously not the secret stuff, but we get to see a lot of what they produce. And um, they have fine university. MIT, for example, is a, an engine of great ideas. Uh, so there's no shortage of that in the US. There's a question here, please. I, I, I'm encouraged by your idea to t take only two years to mm. commercialize ideas. But inevitably, commercialization comes up against uh, the twin forces of meeting standards and regulators. And I wonder how you're going to get around that, particularly, the, for example, the FDA for f food and uh, medical uh, drugs in, in the USA. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point. And it's part, part of how we s selected what we've been doing and what we're prioritizing is exactly that issue. For example, Belascura, it's picking up medical devices that have already been FDA approved, so we don't have that. They're already out there. They're already commercially available. So that's a slightly different model. And on, on, on the salt, it's salt. It is exactly the same. It doesn't have to have any FDA approval. Had it been something that required a chemical change or something different, we probably wouldn't have picked it. I think it's a good point. And then there's a question towards the front here. Please, Chris. Um, when, when you actually are looking for university projects that you want to take over that have been incubated, um, do any of the universities actually look for IPR or some royalties for the work they've done? And how do you ensure there's a balance between uh, what the universities have contributed and the shareholders' needs? Absolutely. That's a fundamental point, a kind of moral point, actually, as much as anything else. Um, we typically give them uh, one-third uh, royalty, uh, so that they will get eventually one-third of the value that we generate. And we think that's fair, because for them, uh, they should get some value. After all, they invented the idea. But it's also fair, because most of them are publicly funded. The ideas that they've come up with have come out of the taxpaying community. They are not investors in it. They've just come up with the idea. And if they get a third of the proceeds back, that's probably a fair deal. And then our, our shareholders are having to put their money up, and they've got the risk of this thing succeeding and not succeeding. And we think two-thirds is a fair, a fair split. So it's not exactly that, but that's pretty much the model we use. Um, you said you had 60 scientists helping. Um, when we've got young, bright students and their uh, lecturers, how do you expect to emulate their ability to develop their ideas further than the 60, I won't say die in the wool scientists you've yeah. got? to make the most use of what, what's being generated? I think that's an interesting one. We've I probably, um, we have been a bit conventional in our approach. We've gone to the people that have got uh, honorary medals from the United States president or have been uh, fellows of the Royal Society. We have done that. We've gone for the sort of old, wise guys. Um, and uh, maybe there is something to be said for going to the younger generation and the bright people who come up with the good ideas. Yeah. Final question, if I may. Um, you, it looks to me as if you're focusing on the three companies, Solaris, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, what percentage is actually looking at new companies or new ideas rather than the three where you're waiting for the big breakthrough? Well, that's interesting. We're, we're a small team. Um, and um, what we do, in fact, we've taken the projects, uh, the three that we've got, and we've put new management teams into each one. And they're dedicated to those. And then the existing guys are carrying on coming, looking up at new things. Okay. So that we've got another four or five in the, in the, in the handout that we're working on. And there's more behind that that we're looking at all the time to see what's, uh, what's the best one to pick for the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, right, in the end of time, we've got one final question at the front here, please, Chris. Have you got any EIS or VCT backing? Uh, we are EIS, EIS approved, yeah. And we have been uh, both for our IPO and the subsequent listing that we did, the subsequent uh, issue. We haven't got any VCTs on board. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you very much indeed. Great, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.